Hello, you guys. This is future Bryce editing Bryce. And I just finished editing this episode that you are about to watch. And I wanted to give you guys a little note before you get into the episode. Of course, this is a subject that's been a long time coming for me on this channel. This is uh, obviously a subject regarding the legend of Louis Charles, who was the son of Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI. Many of you know the legend is that he was smuggled out of prison and eventually ended up in the United States of America with a new name. He was basically taken in by a family that worked for the royal family. And again, they were granted land in the colonies where they brought Louis Charles to the colonies under the name Daniel. Now, with that being said, the, the stuff we're looking through in this series regarding this family is the research that was done and collected by one of Daniel's descendants, a man named Stephen. We are going to be going through his research that is put all together in a book called the Book of Daniel. Now, when I start this episode, you'll hear me say that I have not read any of this information. We're kind of doing it together as like a study group. With that being said, going forward for the next few sections however long it takes us to get through his work i probably am going to go ahead and read pri everything prior to presenting it because i felt like going through some of this stuff there was some irrelevant information that he included as many of you guys know i studied um the art of storytelling and when you're telling a story you you definitely do not want to include information that's not relative to what to the to the subject of your story. And so when we get into the beginning of his research, what he's going to do is he's going to give you a history of Germany and France in a particular region and how many battles were fought over history over this particular land and how the family name, they don't know if it's actually the, the name that Louis the the who would have been Louis the 17th, Louis Charles, the name that he took, the family name that he adapted as his own with his adopted family. They don't know if this is actually a Germanic name or a French name. And in my opinion, a lot of the details of the history of this region where this particular family is from is irrelevant to the story because the story of Louis Charles, he was a bourbon. That's his family line. He adapted this name from his adopted family. And so if I were covering this on my own without looking, without going through Stephen's research, I basically probably would have just summed it up that way. I would have been like, this is who this family is, the family that adopted him. They worked for the royal family. They were either of Germanic or French heritage. The whole region has gone back and forth between the two countries. So, and I even clarify in this that, that the genetic makeup of a German person or a French person is identical. So it doesn't even really matter, right? People are people. What matters is the fact in, in relationship to this story and this legend, what matters is that Louis Charles, the alleged person who took the name Daniel, is part of the establishment, bloodline establishment. With that being said, that doesn't necessarily mean he was a bad person, obviously, and the whole setup was that they were eventually, they, they smuggled him out because their intention was to eventually put him back on the throne of France, which of course never happened. But now it is believed, allegedly, that this family kind of controls the world behind the scenes. So again, the first part of this research, we're going to go through it all. You'll see me go through all the battles, all the back and forth between France and Germany. It's all in his research. Again, in my opinion, it's irrelevant. But we do go through it because we're going through his research. Moving forward, I am going to go through everything beforehand just to kind of see if there's other stuff that I think is kind of irrelevant. So we can kind of like cliff notes version that and not have to go through all the details that don't actually even matter to the overall story that we're exploring. With that being said, if if you aren't interested in the battles between France and Germany over this particular land, you can skip. In, in the beginning, we talk about the Stephen, the guy who wrote. So the first part of this episode, you might want to listen to. But when we get into the region of France and Germany, where allegedly this family that he was adopted into came from, and it gets too tedious for you because it kind of got for me, you can skip to about the 40 minute mark. And that's going to bring you to around the area where we start getting into his um, arrival 
into America, into the colonies and the family that in the, in the different, um, the, some of the records don't add up. Like some records say he was born in the United States while other records say he was not born in the United States. And it looks like there's some evidence that there was some fraudulent tampering with some paper. So that's interesting, right? And that is relevant to his story. So try listening to it, all of it, but if it gets too much, just skip to like the 40 minute ish mark. And that's going to take you into more relevant information. Uh, otherwise, um, if you enjoy military history, then hopefully you'll enjoy this. And again, please be mindful of using particular words in the comment section. This is a very dangerous topic, and I hope you guys enjoy. Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. This is going to be a very interesting, probably, series that we're going to do. Um, this is a subject that I have wanted to cover for a very long time, but honestly, I've been a little bit afraid to cover. Um, some of my colleagues, I guess we can say, people who kind of do the same thing that I do on YouTube for the same purposes, if you know what I mean, have tried to breach this topic before and they themselves have gotten some serious very serious um i don't want to say the word t-h-r-e-a-t-s i'm not a stranger to these these types of things you guys know i get them a lot especially going through the missing books of the bible i got a lot of them um but those for me were just from crazy fundamentalist christians um but these t-h-r-e-a-t-s um, or more serious because the subject that I want to go through with you guys has to do with the hidden family, allegedly for entertainment purposes only the, uh, hidden family behind the puppet masters behind the establishment. We'll say, um, I will say the name one time. Uh, if you don't know this family name, I, I know it's dangerous to say this name on the YouTube. Uh, Pesor, the Pesor family. Now, if you guys are familiar with this family name, you are probably familiar with the legend, and we'll say legend for now, because we don't know for sure. This could all just be like junk conspiracy put out by the establishment to confuse us. I, I don't know. But, you know, it is important to, to, to discern things, to look at things, as Aristotle says, you know, um, it's a sign of intelligent mind when you can entertain an idea without accepting it. So we can entertain this idea without actually accepting it, taking everything with a grain of salt. So this particular family, the, we'll call them the P family, the P family, um, they allegedly, as legend states, descend from Marie Antoinette and Louis the Sixteenth. Marie Antoinette obviously was a Habsburg, very powerful, powerful family for many centuries. And Louis the 16th was uh, the heir to the crown of France through the Bourbon line. We've talked a lot about the Bourbon line. He was a descendant of Louis the 14th, who was the Sun King. Um, uh, he was a descendant of Henri the fourth. We've covered Henri the fourth or Henry the fourth. He was the first Bourbon King after he took over from the house of Valois, his cousins um, who did not make it to the throne and so therefore the, the 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 crown was passed to Henri who was living in Navarre we've talked a lot about Navarre 
which was a part, it's in the Pyrenees. It's part of, at that point, the kingdom of Navarre was a principality, a duchy that was connected to, it was the same family as the ruling family of, of France. We've talked about Navarre with Cesare Borgia. Um, he was married into the, this family, this particular Bourbon family. And so as we know, something I think we know for a fact now, there are particular families involved, um, bloodlines, if you will, that have been kind of the governors of our world for a very long time. And that's the problem, right? Trying to kind of watch what I say. Please, please be careful about what you say in the comment section regarding this subject. I really, I'll tell you why I'm, I'm trying to keep this on YouTube in a second. But we know that there are particular uh, families that are governors, we'll say, the establishment that don't have maybe perhaps our best interests at heart. Not saying again that every single person who's a part of these particular family is bad. We have to be very careful about that. Each individual human being has their own free will choice and people should be judged based on their own actions, not the actions of their family. I think you guys are all in agreement with me on that. I get very, very angry when I see vigilante people trying to just destroy a person simply because of their last name when they haven't even taken the time to look and see if that person is actually guilty of the crimes their family is guilty of. And so I think that is very dangerous, um, very dangerous for all of us. If that type of perspective and vigilanteism is allowed to persist, um, I think we need to be a little bit more, uh, have, have more, com the, humans are complex. There's complexity here, right? And so we need to be a little bit more discerning. So nonetheless, it is believed that when Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI were in the French Revolution, you guys know, I've said it before, no one throws a revolution like the French. They win when it comes to, just, they're just extra, right? Like the French are extra when it comes to, to revolutioning. Um, and so they win the, the, they definitely win the more dramatic prize of being savage AF when it comes to, to revolutions. That's where the guillotine comes from. And that Marie Antoinette and Louis the 16th, um, the last official reigning monarchy of France before Napoleon came in. Uh, were the House of Bourbon before they met met the guillotine. They had a date with the guillotine. So they had children, of course, and the whole legend behind this particular P family is that they are descendants of Marie Antoinette and Louis the Sixteenth through one of their sons. That one of their sons was actually smuggled out of the war zone, we'll say, and they were brought to America where they grew and of course the family grew and allegedly they've been kind of the puppet masters that's that's the legend as as it is again take it all with a grain of salt some of this could just be junk conspiracy um it could be um embellished things tend to get embellished a lot so um i've been wanting because this is fascinating to me like at, at the end of the day this stuff is juicy and it's fascinating again whether i have i don't have an opinion right now let's just put it that way it's okay to not have an opinion i think that's another thing we need to know understand like you don't have to have an opinion on something i don't have an opinion on the p family i don't have enough information at this point to have an opinion i just think it's interesting and i am curious to learn more and i'm curious to hold this information with me for a little while before i make my mind up of whether i believe it or not and so, but, but nonetheless, because so many of my colleagues on the YouTube who have tried to cover this family and the legend around them, because they've gotten so many um, T-H-R-E-A-T-S sent to them, scary ones, I totally understand them backing off of it. And um, so I've been very hesitant to, to touch. I've had a lot of, you guys know, I've, I've been through a lot with, with the establishment and what I've been doing on YouTube. And so um, I've been kind of holding back. Now, there's a book that uh, TikTok has been recommending, The Book of Daniel, written by Stephen, P-A-Y-S-E-U-R, I'm not going to say the name again, Stephen P., who allegedly is a descendant of this family living in the United States. He's an American. It's called The Book of Daniel again, and I ordered it. It looks like it might be self-published, which is fine, um, and I'm interesting to, interested to see what he has got to say. With that being said... Um, there might be, I haven't read it yet, but there might be some words in here that I cannot say on YouTube. You guys know why. And so if that were to be the case, I'll have to 
kind of pause and give you the pretend word. Um, I think you guys understand why. Now, the reason why you're probably thinking, why don't you just do this on Rumble? Because then you don't have to worry about it. The reason why I'm trying to keep this on YouTube is even though this information affects everyone in the world, because regardless of what country you live in, regardless of, of whatever, you are you are experiencing, obviously, the corruption of these powers that be. So, however, this particular family, though, hails from France. And we know that my French friends that watch don't have access to the alternative platform. Their country has not allowed that for them. And that is not their fault, right? You guys know every time I do put something over there that has to go over there, I always say to my French friends, you guys email me for, and I'll send you the episode so that you can have it. Um, if there's absolutely no way that I can put it up on, on the YouTube. However, I want this to be a discussion amongst us all. Again, watch your words. And I absolutely want our French friends because this affects them as they are French. It affects their history and their understanding of their own history. I want them to be able to participate and not have to have me send the hard copy of the episode without them being able to see see the comments. Now, I'm also going to put this on the alternative platform. So if you're watching this from Rumble, I'm sorry, you're going to have the censored word too, so you can have that conversation. But I want the main conversation to be on YouTube uh, due to the people that this affects. I hope that makes sense. So with that being said, we're going to go through the book of Daniel. I ordered this book and different than my, most of my deep dives, most of my deep dives, I would have read the book, done research and then presented it. But I felt like it's been a while since we've read a book. Now, this will not be a spiritual book. Obviously, this is going to go under the conspiracies playlist. But I thought this was probably the best way to navigate the treacherous waters of this platform when it comes to this particular family. So, you know, we're kind of doing a book, a book club, we'll call this a book club. So the algorithms think we're, we're doing, a, which we are, this is a book club. So this is the book of Daniel. Again, I'm going to be reading through the whole thing. Again, any words I can't say that are written, I will give you the pretend word. Um, with that being said, if you would like to purchase a copy of this book for yourself, which I highly recommend you do, if you can afford it, a link is down below in the description box. As always, do your own research. We're, we, we can consider this a study group. Remember back in the day in school where we had study groups? So we're, congratulations, you're now in a study group with me. We're going to, we're going to study this together. We're going to work on this deep dive together. And, um, which I thoroughly enjoy doing because I am trying to work with, navigate this as it is. And so this is a study group. This is a book club study group. Um, anyway, Book of Daniel written by Stephen, P-A-Y-S-E-U-R. So let's get into it. The Book of Daniel, the secret story of princes and pirates, rogues, revolutionaries, and Freemasons in, and Freemasons in North and South Carolina. Sounds juicy, doesn't it? I love when rogue rogues are in are in the description of the book like i think we're all rogues so let's get into it we're all revolutionaries too all right so this was written in 2012 let's do the the author's preface first what you're about to read is what i think a very interesting story it is a story of lies and deception more importantly it is a story of a small corner of north carolina and primarily one of the families who lives there it is a story of connection. Sounds juicy, right? Many people have asked me if this tale is true. I can honestly say that I have no idea. Same, dude. And it's your family. I think we're all in agreement. We don't know if it's true or not. Even the family itself is like, I don't know. So let's keep reading. I like this guy. I am certain that much of what you read here is not true. Some of what you will read here is definitely true. The task for the reader is determined is to determine for him or herself what to believe. I like that. Most of this, when we think about the truth of the world, the disclosure world, most of that stuff is definitely not true. But some of it is absolutely true. So I think we can relate to this dude. He's like, I don't know. Some of it's a lie. Some of it's true. I don't know which is which, but this is what I know. I like this guy. I like him. One thing needs to be kept in mind as you read this book over the years, the name Pay. And then S-E-U-R, 
has been spelled many ways. That makes sense. I think we all know that names change in spelling over time. So I'm going to spell out the different ways this family has said that he has found that his own family has spelled their name. P-A-S-O-U-R, P-A-Y-S-O-U-R, P-A-S-E-U-R, P-A-Y-S-E-U-R, B-E-S-O-U-R, B-E-S-E-U-R are just a few of them. My grandfather spelled his name P-A-Y-S-E-U-R, yet some of his brothers and sisters spelled theirs P-A-Y-S-O-U-R. Many of these spellings I will use interchangeably throughout. After much research, I decided to put everything down in this narrative for the reader to decide. Respect, dude. I respect that. There are way too many coincidences for all of this to be false and way too many assumptions for all of it to be true. However, here it is. I hope you enjoy. I hope it makes you think. And I hope it makes you want to look further into other so-called facts. And he puts facts in quotations. I like this guy already. I like this guy already. Ready? Chapter one, how it all began. Again, this was written in 2012. Just so you guys have a basis of time as to when he came to this information. About 15 years ago, I was poking around on the internet. I was looking for nothing in particular, just letting one thing lead to another. I call these non-searches. Often when I had done similar non-searches, I ran across very interesting topics. Many of these were funny or informative or just even weird. I think this guy is one of us guys. I think he would enjoy, enjoy. I think we, we would all enjoy getting a beer together. I love those days on the internet where you remember back when the internet was like a new thing. There was this this um, page you could go to where you just like let let the Google or whatever it was back then just find random things for you. I can't remember what that was called. If you can remember what that's called, please put that down in the description box below. Sometimes I would share these with friends and family, usually the funny ones. Others were a little more compelling, like the one about the Lincoln County witch. That one was disturbing in as much as I had known many of the people involved in that sword tale. Maybe that will be in another book, but it would be much better if the family involved wrote the story. After all, they lived it and know the facts better than any researcher could ever. Y'all, I'm going to underline that. Do you guys want me? Do you, Our little study group? Just a side note, do y'all want me to like look into the Lincoln County Witch of North Carolina? I'll do it if you want me to. I mean, I'm probably, after we get done with this, I'm probably going to Google it anyway, just because I'm curious and I love a good witch story. So um, and I love a story that has the word sword in it, a sword affair. So if you guys want me to get the gossip for you on this Lincoln County Witch, let me know and I will do it. On this particular day, I decided to search the web to see what, if anything, was on there about me. Who hasn't done that? Who has not Googled themselves? Y'all know you're lying if you said you've never Googled yourself. Of course, we've all done that. I like this guy's honesty. Surprisingly, I found several dozen references to me. Most of them were obscure references to things that I had done at some point and would never be very interesting to anyone. <laughs> Most weren't even very interesting to me. And I was the subject of those references. <laughs> Ain't that true? Ain't that true? You find stuff about you online and you're like, this is boring. Even to me, this is boring and it's about me. I decided to broaden my search to include my, my own family name, P-A-Y-S-E-U-R, the P family. I must digress a bit here. A few years before I began my research, I bought a book by Thomas Marino. Marino was a linear descendant of the original Pay, the P family, who arrived in America 200 years ago. He had painstakingly compiled the genealogy of the Pei, the P family, clan after many years of research. My father, Bob P, and my cousin, Greg P, had supplied Mr. Marino with much of the information he had collected about my branch of the family. Since I had Thomas Marino's book, The P Family, The P Family, The P Family together again, I had begun my own genealogical research. I wasn't just looking for names and dates. I wanted to find stories about these individuals if I could. It was a whole lot easier to look than it was to find, as I discovered very quickly. My father and my cousin Greg were doing the same thing. 
My father put together a family tree and began to catalog births, deaths, and marriages in our own immediate extended family. Greg began to branch out a little more than that. He was following the branches of the family and doing quite a bit of tracing back to ancestry of related families. Greg had found some connections to many famous people from history, such as Daniel Boone. These were quite interesting to most of us. Greg began to send me updates of the more interesting things that he had found. He has never stopped doing that. He probably has hundreds of thousands of names in his database by now. Early on, one of the more interesting things that I had found was our family connection to Macbeth, the Scottish king of Shakespeare's play. That connection was through the Bietti family. This connection would turn up later again. There were very many spellings of our name. Some brothers and sisters even spelled their names differently. Again, that was pretty normal back when people were colonizing the United States. They were scattered all over the country, though most were found in several locations, such as North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Alabama. Most historians and genealogy stated that our family came from Germany, though some said France. I had trouble trying to resolve this contradiction. Continuing my research, I started to find some incredible information, which I referred to my father and to Greg. Both found these new pieces of information to be very interesting. Greg in particular began to trace some face-to-face -face interviewing and became an amateur private eye. You know, the thing about like whether your family came from France or Spain or not, both France and Spain, the, the, the DNA, the genealogies of both French and German families or people from this area, it's very similar. Like if you look at 22 and me are these ancestry places where you put your DNA in, they always put French, France and Germany together, like your ancestors, it, it, it's combined. And you think about that, it's the same chunk of land, the, the borders are imaginary lines. So that makes sense and why there's a lot of confusion. And of course, back, you know, hundreds of years ago, the borders were always changing anyway, and people were always moving in and out. So, you know, German and French people, different languages, different cultures, but genetically speaking, they're the same. They're the same, okay? Even blonde hair, blue eye. We think of blonde hair, blue eyes being very Germanic. It's also very French, right? So, like, if we look at historically at the United Kingdom and the English Isles, people who are genetically from that island that we call the United Kingdom, a genetic person whose ancestors were from that island would have brown eyes and brown hair. However, the blonde hair and blue eyes came into the United Kingdom through William the Conqueror in 1066, who was from France. So the blonde hair, blue eyed is very Germanic, very much part of the French and also from Gaul, that area. All right, in Northern Italy as well, actually in Italy and Greece before the Moors invaded, um, it was blonde hair, blue eyed people. But Greece was known for red haired people. So that makes sense to me anyway. I don't want to go off on a tangent, but that makes sense to me. I know a lot of people in the United States who have uh, ancestors from continental Europe, either France or Germany, and more specifically, it gets kind of jumbled together because it's the same people. All right. We have found connections with the pirate Jean Lafayette, Napoleon's Marshal Michael Ney, Abraham Lincoln, A.A. Springs, Jesse James, Louis the Sixteenth, George the Third, and the Knights Templar, the Illuminati, and many more. I and no one else have been able to confirm most of these connections. However, the more we look into them, the more questions and coincidences that seem to pop up. In other words, the more I know, the more I don't know. Ain't that the truth? The more I learn, the more questions I have. The more questions I have. And you know what, Stephen, if you're watching this, I have to say, buddy, I've said this before. I think a lot of us on this earth actually do have connections to the big I, the establishment in our family somewhere. I, I think we've all been touched by that. So don't even sweat it, dude. The following pages will put forth the efforts of my research in pretty much straightforward manner. Many people will think it is all a work of fiction. Maybe it is. Then again, I believe that there is more to a story than many would think. I prefer to call it speculative nonfiction. I love that. Speculative nonfiction. You be the judge. Oh, man, wait till we the mainstream people start learning about Tartaria, right? Then you're going to have a lot, a huge question mark over what the hell is our true history, right? Chapter two, the Palatine and the immigration to America. The country of Germany, as we know it, has not really been a unified country for very long. Absolutely. 
For much of its history, it has been a loose association of small provinces or even city-states, each ruled by its own ruler. Yes, yes, we know. We actually kind of just spoke about that. Um, duchies. And we, we, we talked about this with, like, this, the Cesare, the Borgia family, that Italy itself, when the Borgias were in control of the papacy, Italy itself was not a political entity. It was it was duchies. You know, we look at that with Spain. You know, before the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabel, it was, it was Castile and Aragon. You had Navarre, Granada, and Portugal over here. So, yeah, absolutely. France, Gaul, Brittany was its own thing. And then France took Brittany. So, absolutely. I think we know that. But it's good that he kind of reminds us that the countries we know today, the imaginary lines of country boundaries that we know today, they, again, they're imaginary lines. They're not really there. And they're kind of a new thing. Kind of a new thing. In fact, in the year 1792, there were coincidentally seven, uh, 1,792 of these states in Germany. Obviously, since then, there has been much consolidation until now. Germany is a prosperous, unified state. One of the reasons in region, excuse me, in Germany is called Palatine. I hope I'm saying that right. That's the English pronunciation if you're German and that's not correct. Um, will you please put that in the comment section? P-A-L-A-T-I-N-E, Palatine. The Palatine area lies on the western border and joins the borders of France and Switzerland. The Alsace and Lorraine region of France are continuous with the Palatine. I hope, again, I'm saying uh, Alsace, A L. S-A-C-A-E and Lorraine, you know, that's Lorraine. Um, again, if you're from that area, I I'm reading this from the English way the English would pronounce it. So um, let me know if that's not the way it's pronounced with um, French or German um, dialect. For those familiar with the history of this area, you know that the Lorraine area has been in contention for many, many years. Wars have been fought there as long as anyone can remember. And both the Alsace and Lorraine have changed back and forth from being a German province to a French province. Literally, we just talked about this. Right? <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Because we literally just said that, like, French and Germany, the French people and the German people, you're the same. Like, and he's saying that, like, the, the borders and everything have changed. You might speak a different language and have different cultures, but same, it's the same genetics. You're, you're, you're the same, the same type of, you're the same flavor of white. Let's just put it that way. Um, this depended on who the winner of the last war was. This movement from French to German, German to French, will prove to have significant, some significance in this story. Because of this back and forth conquest, many people of the Palatine were French speakers and many people in the Alsace-Lorraine region were German speakers. The following is a brief history of the Palatine area. Palatine history. The Palatinate, or German, P-F-A-L-Z, was in German history the land of Count Palatine, a title held by a leading secular prince of the Holy Roman Empire. Geographically, the Palatinate was divided between two small territorial clusters, the Rhenish, or the Lower Palatinate, and the Upper Palatinate. The Rhenish, again, hope I'm saying that right, R-H-E-N-I-S-H, Palatine included lands on both sides of the Middle Rhine River between its main and Nectar, or Necker, Maine and Necker, Necker, that sounds like a southern word, N-E-C-K-A-R, tributaries. Its capital until the 18th century was Heidelberg. The Upper Palatinate was located in north, northern Bavaria on both sides of the Nab River as it flows south toward the Danube and extends eastward to the Bohemian Forest. The boundaries of the Palatine varied with the political and uh, dynastic fortunes of the Count's Palatine. Barbaria, y'all, I'm obsessed with the Barbarian in the Bohemian areas. So much, so much salacious, scandalous stuff has happened there. Like, we've talked about some of the stories that have happened there, but this doesn't surprise me that this legend has to do with this particular area of the word. Again, I might not be saying some of these names correctly. Some of them, obviously, we know. But I'm getting more excited as we get into the study group because I'm reading this for the first time with you guys. So this is this is this is bound to be juicy. If it's coming from Barbaria or if it's coming from Bo the Bo Bohemian area, it is bound to be juicy, you guys. 
The Palatinate was a border beginning in the north on the Moselle River, about 30 miles southwest of Koblenz. Again, I hope I'm saying this right. I'm going to put the words on the screen for you guys. To Bingen and east to not Mainz, down to the Rhine River of Oppenheim, Gunsterblom, and Worms, then continuing eastward above the Nyaka River and about 20 miles east of Heidelberg, then looping back westwardly below Heidelberg to Spire, south to the Rhine River to Alsace, then northwesternly back to its beginning on the Moselle River. I think I'll just put a map up for you guys so you can see it because that's a lot of words. That's a lot of words. That's a lot of them. All right. The first Count Palatine of the Rhine was Hermann the First who received the office in 945, a long time ago. Although a not, not originally hereditary, the title was held mainly by his a, a descendants until his line expired in 1155. And the Bavarian Whistlebacks, Whistlebacks took over in 1180. In 1356, the Golden Bull, a papal bull, an official document, usually commanded from the Pope and sealed with the official papal seal called a bulla, made the Count Palatine an elector of the Holy Roman Empire. So now the papacy is involved. I'm telling you guys, this area of the word is fucking juicy. Like, it's so shady. It's beautiful. I, and again, if you're from this area, it's we know it's not the people. It's these families or some of these members of these families. But I'm getting excited. My heart rate's beating because I know we know this land. We know this land. This land is full of scandal. And that tells you guys, if there's any area of the world that's fault over like this and there's scandals, there's probably something really important there. That's what makes me think like America is actually the original Egypt and Israel. That's one of my biggest um, swears to the Tartarian narrative because so many people have fought, fought over this land like crazy. And why not? America, no offense, have traveled the world many times. And I always say America is one of the most beautiful places, beautiful continents you'll ever visit. It's fucking gorgeous here. And when I say American continent, I mean like Canada too and South America and Latin, the whole American continent. It's breathtaking. So there's magic here, right? So obviously, again, places that people fight over, obviously there's magic there. There's probably some ley lines, you know, stuff like that. So obviously Barbaria, Bohemian area, important, important. Because there are scandals there. So obviously it's important. And now we got the papacy involved. So <laughs> if the papacy is involved, if they're trying to push their way in, we know that there is some really important stuff there. After Martin Luther published his 95 thesis on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg on the 31st of October, 1517, so many people do shit on Halloween. Have you guys notice that? Like, Going through all of all of these um, stories with you guys, I'm going to have to go back and look through my notes and see how many things. I didn't know Martin Luther, even though my grandmother was Lutheran. I didn't know Martin Luther put his thesis that like started it all on Halloween. So, but that again, that's not. They love Halloween, don't they? Like, there's so many things that have happened. And when I do my research, sometimes I'm putting date doubts. I'm like, oh, Halloween. Oh, Halloween. Oh, Halloween. So anyway, many. Okay, so let's let's start that again. After Martin Luther published his 95 thesis on the doors of the castle church at Wittenberg on the 31st of October, 1517, many of his followers came under considerable religious persecution for their beliefs. Perhaps for reasons of mutual comfort and support, they gathered in what is known as Palatine. These folks came from many places, Germany, Holland, Switzerland, and beyond, but all shared a common view on religion. This actually makes sense. I'm going to tag down below my deep dive into King, the King James Bible because there's a lot about that area with Protestants fleeing to this particular area to start to print Bibles, real true Bibles in English, not the King James Bible. I'm not going to get into that, but I will put that if you're interested in that. Um, I will put that down below in the description box for you. The Protestant Eleanor Palatine Frederick V, who lived from 1596 to 1632, called the Winter King, or maybe he ruled from 1596 to 1632, called the Winter King of Bohemia, played a unique role in the struggle between Roman, the Roman Catholics and the Protestant Europe. His election in 1619 as King of Bohemia 
precipitated the 30 years war that lasted from 1619 until 1648. Frederick was driven from Bohemia in 1632, deposed as elector Palatine. During the Thirty Years' War, the Palatine country and other parts of Germany suffered from the horrors of fire and sword, as well as from pillage and plunder by the French armies. This war was based upon both politics and religious hatred, as the Roman Catholic army sought to crush the religious freedom of the politically divided Protestantism. You know, it's so funny. I was listening to Billy Carson the other day and he was bringing this up. No matter like what your genealogy is or where you're hailed from or what you label yourself as, we have all been the enslaved. We have all been the slave owners. We've all been the victors. We've all been the bullies. It just, you know, point one finger at one country saying they're doing something bad. You got three fingers pointing back at you. Many unpaid armies and bands of mercenaries, both of friends and foe, devoured the substance of the people. And by 1633, even the Catholic French supported the elector Palatine for a time for political reasons. Yeah, I guess it doesn't matter how religious you are if, you've not, if you don't have something to eat, right? During the War of the Grand Alliance from 1689 to 97, the troops of the French monarch of Louis XIV ravished the Rhenish Palatine, causing many Germans to immigrate. Many of the early German settlers to America, for example, the Pennsylvania Dutch, were refugees from, pa from the Palatinate. During the French Revolutionary and the Napoleonic Wars, the Palatinate's lands on the west bank of the Rhine were incorporated into France, while its eastern lands were divided largely between neighboring Baden and Hesse. Nearly the entire 17th century in Central Europe was a period of turmoil for Louis XIV of France sought to increase his empire. The War of the Palatinate, as it was called in Germany, aka the War of the League of Ossenburg, began in 1688 when Lewis claimed Palatinate. This is funny, I was sacked because this is when one of my, it's making more sense to me because one of my German lines uh, was from Northern uh, Germany. And from what I understand, when all this was going on, that's when they left uh, Germany in like 1648. They left Germany to come um, to the uh, Americas. They didn't go to Pennsylvania. They went to South Carolina. But nonetheless, that makes sense. So hopefully for the Americans watching, this is ringing a bell for you from some of your history, folklore, and legend. Okay, let's see. The war ended in 1697 with the Treaty of Ryswack. The Palatinate was badly battered, but still outside of French control. In 1702, the War of Spanish Secession began in Europe and lasted until 1713, causing a great deal of instability for the Palatines. The Palatinate lay on the western edge of the Holy Roman Empire, not far from France's eastern boundary. Louis wanted to punish, Louis wanted to push his eastern border to the Rhine, the heart of the Palatinate. While the land of the Palatinate was good for its inhabitants, many of whom were farmers, vineyard operators, etc., its location was unfortunately subject to invasions by armies of Britain, France, and Germany. Mother Nature also played a role in what happened for the winter of 1708 was particularly severe and many of the vineyards perished. So as well as the devastating effects of war, the Palatines were subject to the winter of 1708-1709, the harshest in a hundred years. The scene was set for mass migration. At the invitation of Queen Anne in the spring of 1709, about 7,000 harassed Palatines sailed down the Rhine to Rotterdam. From there, about 3,000 were dispatched to America, either directly or through England under William Penn. The remaining 4,000 were sent to Ireland via England to strengthen the Protestant interest. Although the Palatines were scattered as agricultural setter, settlers over much of Ireland, Major accumulations were found in counties Limerick and Tipperary. As the people progressed and dissatisfactions increased, many of these folks seized opportunities to join their comp 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 compatriots, can't speak words, in Pennsylvania or go to the newly opened settlements in Canada. All right, Canadians, this is YouTube. 
obviously can canadians and america have a very um americans have a very similar settler story there were many reasons for the desire for the palatines to immigrate to the new world oppressive taxation religious bickering hunger for more and better land the advertising of the english colonies in america and the favorable attitude of the british government towards settlements in north american colonies many of the palatines believed they were going to pennsylvania carolina or one of the tropical islands the passage down the rhine took four to six weeks tolls and fees were demanded by authorities of the territories through which they passed taxation right early in june the number of palatines entering rotterdam reached a thousand per week later that year the british government issued a royal proclamation in german that all arriving october of 1709 would be bit sent back to germany we're having this issue still today aren't we the british would not effectively handle the number of palatines in london and there may have been as many as thirty-two thousand by november of 1709 they wintered over in England since there was no adequate arrangements for the transfer of the Palatines to the English colonies. In 1710, three large group of Palatines sailed from London. They first went to Ireland, and second to Carolina, and the third to New York with a new governor, Robert Hunter. There were 3,000 Palatines on 10 ships that sailed for New York and approximately 470 died on that voyage or shortly after their arrival. In New York, the Palatines were expected to work for the British authorities, producing naval stores, tar and pitch for the Navy in return for their passage to New York. They were also expected to act as a buffer between the French and natives on the northern frontier and the English colonies to the south and the east. After the, the defeat of Napoleon, 1814 to 1815, the Congress of Vienna gave the east bank lands of the rhine valley to bavaria these lands together with some surrounding territories again took the name of palatinate in 1838 in this area and in this time the p family is first noted as with many families their spelling has been changed over the years most notably is the fact that the german b and the german p sound very familiar so these letters are often interchanged. Names were often spelled phonetically by registrars and tax collectors as people of that time could neither read or write. The first record that we have of the P family dates back to Hans Jacob. They spell it with a B, B-O-S-H-A-R. I'm not gonna, I was about to say it. I just, P family, but spelled differently. He was born in 1647 to Hans albrecht and anne margaret p family in germany it should be noted that historian id rupp a descendant of the bashors claimed the name was actually a i guess that's another spelling of the name that the name was actually french huguenot which is what we're getting into with the bourbon family according to rupp le bashor same as the p family if that makes sense moved to the palatine sometime after 1614 due to religious persecution in france after living in germany for some time the name was corrupted in both spelling and pronunciation to bashore which then comes the pa you know the p family hope that makes sense basically there's some shenanigans going on with people moving around from france and germany as we said we know that the actual p family from what I'm assuming, the legend states took over the Dauphin of the Bourbon family and he adapted their name. So we're seeing now the scuffling of people, and I guess that's what he's saying, where the originator of this name came from. That's not necessarily, according to legend, his descendant, but the family that took over guardianship of the child that was the Bourbons. Yeah, that's what I'm assuming he's trying to, to say here with all this stuff. As you may recall, it was mentioned earlier that the Palatine bordered the French provinces of Al Alsace and Lorraine, and that many residents immigrated back and forth between the German and French side. This will have some significance in later chapters. The best we can determine, determine jo John George P. family was the first of the family to live in North Carolina. He was born in Lebon County, Pennsylvania in 1720 and lived to the ripe old age of 98. George was buried in the Old Bethel Church Cemetery in what is now Gaston County in 1818. 
The spelling of John George's P family name changed many times after he left Pennsylvania. At various times, it was B-A-Y-Z-O-U-R, B-E-S-O-U-R, and finally P-A-S-O-U-R. After the birth of his children, he was known in North Carolina as George P-A-S-O-U-R Sr. George P. and his wife, Charlotta Hetzer P., had seven children. The only one of those children with significance to this book is George P. Jr. George P. Jr. was born in Maryland in 1764. George Jr. married Hannah Hole, the daughter of Elizabeth Brooks Hole and Jacob Hole in 1780 in Lincoln County, North Carolina. They had eight children. Once again, we will primarily be discussing one of them, Daniel P. In November 1851, George Jr. died and was buried in Costner Cemetery in Gaston County, North Carolina. Now, the question arises as to why the emphasis on the P family. Besides the obvious interest of the author, there are a few things that will come to light. The P family members are key figures into what has sometimes been called the secret history of the Lincoln and Gaston County areas of North Carolina. As we go along, these events and persons will be discussed in greater detail. Chapter 3, The Last Dauphin, which is the French, the prince, the one that's going to inherit the throne. After the American Revolution, most of the monarchies in Europe were uneasy. <laughs> Sorry, that just made me laugh. Have you guys ever seen the play Hamilton? It's great. It's a it's great. But my favorite character in that play is actually King the King George, who was the king during the American Revolution, and his songs are the best because it's a musical. And basically, I just laugh because the American Revolution, like you know, like America was was founded by criminals, like people who committed treason the declaration of independence was like the most epic breakup letter that was ever written the americans the colonists were like you know what england we're breaking up with you and it's not us it's you we've already dumped your tea in the in the water we're done with you we we don't have representation in parliament piss off we're done and of course the american revolution broke out nobody thought the colonists were gonna win this ragamuffin group of colonists what a shock it was they were going up against the greatest military the world had ever known what a freaking shock it was when they won when they won and all of a sudden we have this country that doesn't recognize a monarchy at all like that's the basis of the american constitution it says yo we all equal we're all divine rights. You have certain ina certain inalienable rights that are given to you by your creator, not the effing government. And so I can just imagine that the monarchs, the establishment was like, did not see that coming. They were like, Th those people, those 17 year olds with pow pows, <laughs> they beat up, like, like they took down, what? So I can understand that the other monarchs over Europe were like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. Anyway, so let's let's go through that again. The American after the American Revolution, most of the monarchies in Europe were uneasy. They were afraid the radical concept of government by the common people would somehow take hold in Europe and elsewhere. This was particularly worrisome feeling in both England and France. Well, England had just had their ass handed to them, and France was like, we got holdings, we had holdings in the United States and Canada, and in England, King George III was still smarting from the loss of his most valuable colonies, the American colonies. It also didn't help England's reputation as a military force when their army and navy could not suppress that revolution. At that time, England was the world's major superpower. Listen, the colonists surviving in America, especially in the South, they had to be tough because malaria was everywhere. It was it's hot. It's still hot as hell here. It was not an easy easy terrain to live on and they lived on it and they farmed it and they anyway i'm, st I'm still laughing about this this is this is this is hysterical 
All right, let's start that paragraph again. In England, court King George III was still smarting for the loss of his most valuable colonies, the American colonies. It also didn't help England's reputation as a military force when their army could not suppress that revolution. At that time, England was the world's major superpower. There were also concerns in France. France had aided the American colonies in their struggle against England. Absolutely. Fran the Fran French, you helped us win the American Revolution. Of course, the French knew that the English were not happy about that aid and weren't quite certain what England had in mind for them. There were also concerns that Frenchmen returning from the war in America would begin to think that perhaps... The common Frenchman could run his native country just like the Americans were. Imagine that the common person, the peasants, actually can govern themselves, can actually self-govern without the establishment. Theirs were val th those were valid concerns, as the French Revolution a few years later would prove. As much as England and France were suspicious of each other, the monarchs were even more suspicious of their citizens. It's like a bad pot trip where you're just paranoid monarchies all over europe as much as they despised the american revolution were even more concerned with preserving their own monarchy after all it was pretty good life being the king as the french revolution progressed to the outs of the king and queen and then napoleon began his conquest of continental europe it seems as if the world was turning upside down not only did the revolution succeed in France, but King Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette, the, king, the queen, were imprisoned along with their children. In 1793, the impossible occurred. Both King Louis XVI and his queen, Marie Antoinette, were beheaded in public on the guillotine. Shockwaves radiated throughout Europe. At their deaths, I mean, they weren't the first monarchs to be, you know, um, it had already happened in England with Oliver Cromwell. They weren't the first. If it's happened once, it can happen again. After their deaths, King Louis XIV and Marie Antoinette had two surviving children, Maria Theresa and Louis Charles, the Dauphin. The word Dauphin at that time meant the eldest son of the King of France. In other words, the heir to the throne. Both of the children were imprisoned with their parents. After her parents' execution, Maria Theresa was exiled to Austria to live with her mother's family. She lived for a while in England and Russia and finally died of pneumonia in what had been Austria in 1851. She was 73 years old. The story of Louis Charles the Dauphin is a little bit more confusing and mysterious. We love a good mystery. Rumors have persisted over the years that, the, that, that he... The Dauphin did not die in prison as the official records attest. Instead, Many believe that he somehow escaped and lived in secret elsewhere. In 2000, Louis Charles' remains were exhumed and the DNS, DNA tests were conducted. It was determined that this DNA matched the DNA of Marie Antoinette's living Australian relatives. Interesting. That did not end the controversy, however. It seems that the maternal DNA can only prove that the person tested is somehow related to the mother's family. It cannot be proven from just that DNA test that the person is actually a direct linear descendant. In fact, the maternal DNA only served to corroborate one of the stories circulating about the lost Dauphin. Here is the story. In October of 1793, Marie Antoinette climbed the steps, the scaffold, and was beheaded just like her husband before her. Reportedly, her last words were, I am sorry for what I have done. She said this because as she stepped on the foot of one of the men waiting on the scaffolding, so she stepped on his foot, she's like, sorry, that's basically what happened. Still locked away in prison were her two surviving children, Maria Teresa and the young Dauphin, Louis Charles. There were many in the country who wanted to see the young Charles, now nominally Louis the Seventeenth, take his rightful throne. One of those was a man named Tolan. He was known for his loyalty to the throne. So much so that he had given the nickname Fidel by the queen. He had been working for some time to have the royal family released from prison with no success. He had a group of other people continue to work for the release of the young king, only eight years old. His group included the Marquis Dirias and the Dr. Nuden and Dr. Senor. The money behind these loyalists was in number. 
The money behind the loyalist was a member of the privileged class, Prince de Condé. The plan was to somehow free Louis Charles, then move him to Vendée, which was a staunchly loyalist area. So another, I guess another place in France. Let me know. I'll look that up if, that, if that's in France. There he could be secluded, hidden, and protected until he could assert his rightful claim to the throne. The plan they concocted was to replace the young king with another young boy of similar size and build, and then spirit Louis Charles away. The Marquis had found such a boy, a cousin of the young king. This young boy was very sick. The doctor was sent to confirm that this boy would pass for Louis. He confirmed the boy was suffering from a form of scrofula, which would eventually render his limbs useless. I've never heard of S-C-R-O-F-U-L-A. I've never heard of that before, but let me know if you've heard of that, that disease. He was deaf and the disease he suffered from had damaged his brain. He no longer was coherent on the rare occasion when he tried to speak. Plus his heart. There were two people who worked in the prison, a Mr. and Mrs. Simon, who were persuaded to assist the Marquis and the doctor in freeing Louis Charles. They were promised a house in the country far from the prison and 600 pieces of gold. The, lung, the young Louis Charles himself was not well. The dampness of the cell he was kept in and the abuse he had suffered had taken a toll on his health. He had requested some toys to play with and the public safety committed, committee had consented to his request. Mr. Simon was in charge of finding the hobby horse that Louis Charles had requested. While Simon was finding the hobby horse, the doctor was visiting the prison every day. He insisted that the young king was ill and suggested his long luxurious hair be cut short so that his brain would not overheat in reality it was because his replacement had short hair mrs simon cut louis charles's hair the date had been set for the switch on the morning dot the doctor and tolan picked up the hobby horse they had purchased from a local toy store it had a hollow body and was quite large the doctor drugged the replacement child and placed him inside the, the hollow horse body they took the horse to the prison and led it in the cell with Louis Charles. Later that night, the switch was made. Mr. Simon went into the cell and removed the replacement boy from the horse and dressed him in the king's clothes. The king was dressed as a peasant and hidden and hidden in the washroom, Mrs. Simon's laundry basket. Sounds like Annie. Doesn't Annie do this? Doesn't she hide in the laundry baskets and that's how she gets out of the orphanage? The next morning, Toulon arrived to help the Simons move their new moved to their new home in the country. Among their belongings was one of a very large, large laundry basket containing Louis Charles, Louis the Seventeenth, the boy king of France. This was in January of 1794. The carriage drove slowly to the country until they came to the village of Port Macon, where the washerwoman was waiting. They unloaded the basket from their carriage and placed it in the carriage of the washerwoman. This was no ordinary washerwoman. She was actually, she was actually the Marquis disguised in women's clothing. The Marquis delivered the king into the protection of the Prince de Conde in Vendée. The young king stayed in, in, in seclusion at Vendée for several years, hardly ever leaving the palace. During that time, he was instructed as to which of the revolutionaries were an extreme danger to his safety and which members of the French no no nobility could be trusted. After a period of time, it was decided that leaving Vende, that leaving Vende, he missed, that was a typo, would be the safest option for Louis Charles. Prince de Conde decided to put him into the care of the one person who who no one would ever suspect, General Kleber. I hope I'm saying this right. I'm, I'm pronouncing it in the English way. K-L-E-B-E-R, General Kleber, Jean-Baptiste Kleber. Before we continue with the story today, I want to give a brief shout out to one of our sponsors, Miramate. Miramate is a sister company to Spooky2. And let's go ahead and just take a gander at the website for a moment because I am so excited about this product. Actually, there are so many products on this website, you guys. It is a PMF mat. So this is along the lines of Spooky2 where it's working with frequency, Tesla technology, to heal you basically of course a lot of people are familiar with the big mats that you can lay on that it works on your whole body but there's also like a mini magic mat as well that you can sit on there's the uh uva therapy um we also have these things these mirror mate mini magic you can take you guys you can take this 
on a run with you. You just clip it to your outfit or hiking and it helps keep your body from basically falling apart while you are doing what you love to do. Analog PMF therapy involves the use of devices that emit low frequency electromagnetic waves. These waves are designed to penetrate the body and stimulate cellular functions. Unlike digital PMF devices, which generate pulse signals using digital electronics, analog PMF devices produce continuous and smooth waveforms closely resembling the natural magnetic fields found in the environment. This can help with sleep problems, pain and, infla pain and inflammation, mood issues, fatigue and lethargy, and difficulty concentrating. You guys, there are so many products. I swear to God, I, I just did a video. I just filmed a video with Brad. You guys know Brad. He's with Spooky 2 and with Mirror Mate. And I could not get over the amount of products that this company actually has. They have videos, obviously, of customer reviews. So if you want to go on the website, which we listed down below, you can look at all of the customer reviews. I mean, their shop guys, they have PMF machines, the light devices, light cold laser devices. They have um, products for fertility. They have a specific product under um, under their cold laser devices that are specifically for your period for women. They have stuff for men's prostates. This is an incredible. I cannot wait to use this product myself. I, I am so 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 excited. Now, as always, with this product as well as Spooky Two, if you place my name. Bryce Watson, B-R-I-C-E-W-A-T-S-O-N, at discount, discount code, you will get 5% off of your purchase, just like with Spooky 2. So as always, everything will be down in the description box below. As Miramay, just like Spooky 2, has incredible customer services. They are really an incredible company. They've treated me very, very, very well. I know from some of you who've reached out to me, you tell me that they actually were so good to you as well. And they helped explain things to you and helped work you through using the product. So if this is something you're interested in, I would absolutely encourage you to try this product, get in touch with Brad and go ahead and explore the website. There's so many options, different price points of things you can do. And it's an excellent way to get your help back. All right, you guys, let's get back to the scandalous and juicy deep dive. All right, you guys, where did we leave off before we heard from our awesome sponsors? Let's just recap. So we've got this book written by Stephen Pesor. I'll just go ahead and say it one more time. But as you know, we're not going to be saying that name too often because it will flag. This is a very scandalous family and that name triggers things. So he's written a book called The Book of Daniel, which is literally him outing his family. And he's basically claiming, as the legend states, that the P family came from Marie Antoinette and Louis the Sixteenth's son, the Dauphin of France, who would become, if he had taken the throne, Louis the Seventeenth. So legend states that when the children were being held in prison with their parents before their parents were executed, they're claiming that Louis Charles, the little boy, the Dauphin, was replaced with his cousin. His co they justify it that his cousin was like sickly anyway, so whatever. He's probably going to die. I, this is the thing about the controllers and the establishment. They just don't... The only human life that they respect is their own. <laughs> They'll even throw their con con cousins under the bus. So they have this elaborate plan where they got a rocking horse, basically, and they put the child in a rocking horse and entered him into the prison. It was supposed to be a toy for the Dauphin for Louis Charles. And then they got the kid out and they put Louis Charles in a laundry basket that was then taken with a family to their cottage where then the kid was removed from the laundry basket and put into custody of other people. These were obviously or allegedly this was obviously arranged by people who were loyalists to the monarchy. We know that the P family that that is not the family name of the Dauphin, but because they took him in and gave him that name, now allegedly, as the legend states, they are the puppet masters behind the scene controlling the establishment. That, again, is the folklore. So, as I said earlier, I'm taking it all with a grain of salt. It's very entertaining. It is very um, concerning that when people talk about this family on YouTube, things happen. 
that gives me pause that maybe there is some truth, some truth, maybe a lot of, as this guy says in the beginning of the book, a lot of probably lies mixed in with some truth. So anyway, what we know is that where we left off is that Louis Charles, this little eight year old kid whose parents are about to be or have been executed, has been now smuggled out of the prison and replaced by his cousin and is now being helped by people who are loyal to the bourbon line to the monarchy of france oh and again apparently which i find hysterical all these monarchies in europe are freaking out they're freaking the fuck out because the american revolution just happened and the peasants won the commoners won and so they're like oh crap are our people gonna pick up arms against us which is exactly what happened in france hence why louis charles was taken into hiding and escaped the prison and all that stuff now, again, they did state that the body of what who they thought was Louis Charles was exhumed and the DNA was tested, the mitochondrial DNA, and it did match some of Marie Antoinette's Austrian dis or relatives, not descendants, but her siblings, descendants. And that's why they, the legend states it was a cousin, because just because the mi mitochondrial DNA matches does not mean that he's actually the son of Marie Antoinette. There's just the familiar dna patterning coming from the mother's line so anyway very juicy so let's pick up where we left left off with jean baptiste clever I, I don't know if i'm saying that right again i don't speak french but jean baptiste he's a general was born in the alsace region that is province again in 1753 so again this jean baptiste guy is going to be the one that's going to be the guardian of little louis charles allegedly as legend states he was one of napoleon's most successful generals he was known for his reluctance to fight and his disdain for his superiors he was a rebel however once he was engaged in battle he fought to win the napoleonic guide states clever shown during the campaign fighting well at alexandria el arish jaffa RC and the independent command at Mount Tabor, where he held off vastly superior numbers. Y'all go, you guys know I don't really like military history, so wah, wah, wah. That's how I hear it. I don't give a shit. Like, military history is not my thing. I only want to know if it's relevant to the juiciness of the story. Okay. Louis Charles was given a folder full of papers identifying him and confirming his true identity, which was placed with General Kleber, Jean Baptiste, for safekeeping. He was made John Baptiste Ward and uh, aided him in battles in Egypt, Syria, and other places. All through this time, he was introduced to others as Jean Baptiste's nephew, Louis, or Louis. God, what a life this kid has lived. By eight years old, he was in a French prison. He gets smuggled out and replaced with his cousin in a rocket horse. He has to hide in a laundry basket like the little orphan Annie as he's brought to another area of France. And now he's got to go into all these battles in like Egypt with his dude that's his protector. But what a, uh, what a life. What a life. While they were in Egypt with Napoleon, Louis became sick and it was decided that he should return to France for his health. He did so in 1799, leaving his mentor and guardian is Jean Baptiste in Egypt. Shortly after Louis's return to France, Jean Baptiste was assassinated by a knife wielding fanatic in Cairo. Louis was at this point living with and working as an attache to General. God, French is so hard. Desua? D S I A I X. You know, like French, you don't say half the word. So that's a while. Let me know in the comment section. I was about to say Devereaux, but that's Blanche from the Golden Girl. Should we just call him Dev Devereaux? Should we just channel a little bit of Blanche Devereaux into this story? I mean, literally, she's from the South. I'm from the South. She was saucy. I can be a little bit saucy. Let's just make him Devereaux. Papers were sent to Devereaux after Jean-Baptiste's death. Naming Louis as his only heir, Jean-Baptiste had become a very rich man from inheritance and from the spoils of war. He left Louis the equivalent of $1 million. <laughs> That's not a lot of money these days. I mean, don't get me wrong. I totally take a million dollars, but not a lot of money. But, um, I mean, Louis Charles was the prince. He grew up at Versailles. Was, for his first part of his childhood was spent at Versailles. Then he became this, like, mercenary 
war kid following this dude around all these battles and now he's got a million dollars because this jean baptiste character had no had no children so it went to this kid again it was decided that france was becoming too unsafe for louis louis so with assistance from many people louis escaped across the channel to england he stayed in england for some time and was taken under the wing by queen charlotte king george the third's wife that's interesting. Uh, the city of Charlotte, North Carolina, and the county in which it resides were named after her. I just say it's interesting because did Charlotte know if this story is true? Highly speculative. But would she have known who what his real identity was? I'm sure. Like if this is a establishment, this is what what they did. That I, maybe they didn't know. But I, you know. Speaking practically, if I were the queen and my husband was going mad, King George was going crazy and he just lost the colonies and the French Revolution just happened and your counterparts just got their heads chopped off, I would be a little concerned taking their son in. Just saying. It is likely that Queen Char Charlotte was a relative of Louis, considering both Charlotte and his mother, Marie Antoinette's Austrian German. Oh, there you go. They're all related. They are all related. It was about this time while the 16-year-old Louis was under the protection of Queen Charlotte that Napoleon discovered his identity and whereabouts. The English royal family, fearing for Louis' safety, decided that America was probably the safest place for him to be. This would be far from Napoleon's reach. This story is just not seeming very believable. Like, I'm not saying that there's not this P family that's not a descendant of the Bourbons that I can believe, but this particular story sounds like a fairy tale of how he came to be. But nonetheless, again, we know there's a lot of false deeds mixed in with truth. I'm not doubting that there's a family, the P's, that are controlling things. I'm not doubting that they are a descendant of the Bourbon, the House of Bourbon. However, this is getting a little far-fetched. The waymaster for Louis' father, Louis the Sixteen, was also living in England at this time. He was another person from the Lorraine area, and his name was Gregory, or excuse me, George. I don't know where I get George. Pay sore. The word we'll just say pay sore for now in French means weight master. In other words, he was in charge of weighing out the gold and silver to pay the employees and purchase of the royal court the paymaster during that time many people were known by their professions and often took their professional name as their surname for example carpenter cooper mason baker knight smith fisher and many other were very common louis the 17th assumed the identity of daniel pay hmm, p family the paymaster's son so that's what he gets from the book of Daniel. And they sailed to America. King George had furnished a ship and enough provisions and money to enable them to get settled in. One very wrong or incorrect thing that is posted widely on the internet is that Daniel purchased a number of shares in the Virginia Company. The Virginia Company was formed by King James I by charter in 1606 to help promote the colonization of the new American colonies. Much stock was sold and other fundraising measures were used, including lotteries to finance the colonization efforts. And of course, King James lived well before this kid was born. So, no. So that's how he ends up in America. He is adopted, basically, hidden identity by this guy who works for the royal family. He takes their name, changes his name to Daniel, and now he's coming to America to hide from Napoleon. Many wild claims were used to entice people to invest. One of the most, so we're talking about the Virginia. Let's go back and uh, let's reread that again. I, I'm sorry. I'm the one that got distracted. So let's just read that again. The Virginia Company was formed by King James I by charter in 1606 to help promote the colonization of the new American colonies. Much stock was sold and other fundraising measures were sold, including lotteries to finance the colonization efforts. Many wild claims were used to entice people to invest. One of the more popular ones was there were large quantities of gold to be found in the New World. This didn't quite pan out for the investors, if you will excuse the pun. Besides advocating and encouraging colonization, the main objective of the Virginia Company was to make money for its investors. 
They hope to achieve this by having Settler succeed in Virginia and the Carolinas. They would then export to England, pay taxes and tariffs, and everyone would profit. In 1622, the charter was revoked for the Virginia Company as a result of the Indian Massacre. Both Virginia and Carolina became crown colonies, meaning that any and all the profits went directly to the crown and the king's designees, not to stockholders. There were none anymore. Since Daniel was not born until the late 1700s, it would have been impossible to buy shares in a company that had been out of business for over 150 years. I just said that. Checking the facts on this that are posted on the internet can sometimes be very enlightening, especially when many of the conspiracy theorists keep citing each other. <laughs> that happens, doesn't it? The truthers will quote, quote each other. And neither, neither of them have facts. They're just quoting each other. The P family story has enough mystery and intrigue without fabricating facts and can very easily be disproven. There have also been promises from the royalists in France and from King George III there would be people in the area where Daniel was moving who would give him aid, comfort, and protection as needed. I thought he had like a million dollars anyway. Like, isn't he going to be able to use that to reestablish in America? More on this later when we discuss other characters in the story. Many historians like this one state that Daniel P. bought shares in the Virginia Company before he left England for America. That was impossible as the D Virginia Company, again, was dissolved by King James in 1624 when he made Virginia a royal colony. They decided to sail to North Carolina, Carolina and landed at Bodie Island on the North Carolina Outer Bakes. The Bodie family had been granted the land on and around Bodie Island as they were relatives of King George III. After a short stay with the Bodies, George and Daniel moved to the frontier of North Carolina near present-day Dallas, North Carolina, for two reasons. The first and most important reason was the difficulty anyone would have in tracking down the young monarch. Second, there was already a family residing in the area who were distant relatives of the P family and the P family from Palatine via Pennsylvania, now calling themselves the P's. They could fit right in by only changing one letter in their surname. And again, so he's not related to these families at all. These families are just connected to the guy that took him in as a son for his own protection to hide him from Napoleon. So the P family is not the Bourbon family. The Bourbon kid just moved into them. All right. To give George and Daniel a cover story, King George granted George 600 acres of land in North Carolina. Since this was after the Revolutionary War, this would have been impossible for a British sovereign to be giving away land in a separate and sovereign country. The monarchy was fully aware of that. King George III drafted a land grant to George P. and backdated it to 1749. The newly independent United States, the newly independent United States, words, the newly independent United States of America had been a practice. Let me try this again. The newly independent United States of America had made a practice of honoring land grants that had been awarded prior to, prior to their independence. This was no exception, even though it turned up many years later. Here is a portion of that grant. Granted to George P. family of France by His Majesty George II of England, ye parcel of land measuring 600 acres in ye district of Tyron in ye province of Carolina, 1749 so his dad he basically forged a, a treaty from his dad most of the land grants in this area were not issued until the 1760s so this one was unique another curious thing was that it was in seven another y'all words another curious thing was that in 1749 there was no tyron county it was not formed until eight years after king's second second reign in 1768 and divided into rutherford and Lincoln counties in 1779, still the deed was accepted in George's rights and force. So it wasn't even a good, it was like when you were a kid and you tried to sign your parents' name to notes to your teacher. Like it wasn't even a good, whatever. George P. died in 1851 and the land and all his possession passed to his son, Daniel P., a.k.a. Louis Charles, the lost Dauphin. 
Thomas Marino and his excellent book, P Family, P Family, P Family, P Family, together again, disputes the dates for Daniel P's birth. He shows that Daniel was born on September 13th, 1793 in Lincoln County, North Carolina. Of course, the Dauphin of France, Louis Charles, birthday is dated as March 27th, 1785 in Paris which is an eight-year difference. This is easy to explain or at least give a plausible explanation. With so many forged documents and changing names to allow the prince to escape, one of the simplest would be to show that one or the other was either too old or too young to possibly be Louis the Seventeenth. It would seem that the discrepancy would have little relevance. This shows the connection between the royal family of France and the P family of North Carolina. We will pick back up with this connection as we move through this odd tail so here's actually the tombstone that's interesting of daniel p the lost dolphin here's another so here's another tomb picture of the tombstone i'd actually be curious to go and visit because north carolina is not that far from where we live so it's in the south so um guys that's where we're going to stop it for today we'll pick up next time with chapter four peter peter stewart nay um it's a very thin book so it probably won't take us a, that many parts to get through this but i'd love to hear your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below and again please be careful with what you say because this is a very a very interesting topic with the gods and the lords of youtube so again there are some tall tales i believe in this story but there's also some truth i do believe there is a connection between this family and the house of bourbon however i don't know um how they ended up in america i don't know if that tale is actually true i do think there is something to this daniel daniel guy hence why it's called the book of daniel but anyway i'm sure we'll get into it more as the story continues